Can vitamin D3 in supplements cause cholesterol levels to increase? I've not ever really seen that happen or seen any research, Marie, that shows that to be the case. So it wouldn't be at all um, a suspicion of mine to see cholesterol elevate as a result of vitamin D supplementation. Remember that vitamin D is made from cholesterol, not the other way around. Taking vitamin D doesn't increase your cholesterol. You need cholesterol to make vitamin D from sunshine. Um, biochemically speaking. So no, um, again, in my experience and in, and in, as far as I know in the medical research, no vitamin D supplementation has ever been shown to increase high, uh, cause high cholesterol. Uh, let's see here. Robert wants to know, should vitamin D3 be taken with K2? Yes and no. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of that question coming in of late. K2 helps push calcium into your bone. Okay, now vitamin D3 helps you absorb calcium in your gut to your blood. So what happens is you take a lot of vitamin D, you're gonna you're going to impact the absorption of the calcium from the diet, from the food that you're eating. And so you're going to potentially theoretically get more calcium from the food you eat and it's going to hit your blood, right? And so vitamin K, oops, pushes blood calcium into the bone. So what some people are out there saying is that if you take vitamin D, it actually will cause calcium deposits or plaques to form in your arteries if you're not also taking vitamin K2. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. Now, in theory, it is not a bad idea to make sure you're getting adequate vitamin K2 in your diet and uh, inadequate vitamin K. But, you know, here's, I'm going to come from the perspective of running tests because that's what I do. I don't like to guess. When people come to see me in my nutrition practice, it's all about being as objective as we can possibly be because Research um, has to, to a certain extent, be somewhat subjective. Not all research is, is going to be fitting for everyone. So we can't say that this is true of everyone, right? And what we can also not say is everyone, when their vitamin D levels are low, that everybody with low vitamin D also has low levels of vitamin K2. As a matter of fact, vitamin D levels are low in approximately 90% of the people I see, vitamin K2 levels are low in approximately 10% of the people that I see. So to answer your question is, if, if you're getting it tested and you're low in D but not low in K, you don't need to take K with D, okay? If you're just low in D, then just take the D. Uh, does that make sense? So hopefully that answers your question. The, again, the, the, the premise here is, is specificity as opposed to guessificity, right? And a lot of people... Yeah, go out and they'll buy a product that has vitamin D and K2. And even I have a formulation of vitamin D with vitamin K, but you don't have to be scared of taking vitamin D by itself, especially right now. Like if you're trying to do vitamin D therapy, so there's something called high dose D therapy. And so the kind of the general strategy of, of this is you take a thousand units international units per pound body weight. Okay, so if you're 150, let's make this simple. If you're 150 pounds, you take 150,000 units of D and you do that for three days. Okay, and if you really want to do this even more aggressively after the first three days, then you cut this in half. So divide it by two and then do that for three more days. And so you actually are taking higher levels of vitamin D for a short period of time. It's a six day stent that you're actually taking high doses of vitamin D and then you stop. And if, you know, if this is what you're talking at or getting at, you don't need K because you're not in, th in six days, you're not going to create calcium buildup in your arterial lining. I mean, that's a ludicrous thought. And I, and I don't know who started this whole thing about having to take vitamin D with K. Um, but it's not right for everybody. And so don't fear it is my point. Now, if you're just going to take high doses of vitamin D indefinitely, then taking it with vitamin K might not be a bad idea. But again, 
it's not something you need to do, especially if you're going to do something like this high dose vitamin D therapy. Let's see here. What uh, should vitamin D, let's see, I answered that one. Can the villi in the small intestine recover from gluten after years of damage and how long does it take? Yes. So generally speaking, the villi in the small intestine do recover, but they don't recover if you're following a traditional gluten-free diet. So what research shows, and again, this is part of immune function. So those of you who are listening to me, one of the best ways to build immune system function is to follow no grain, no pain. And one of the reasons I wrote this book and published it with a major publisher is because I wanted the world to get this message. This book has now been published in five different languages worldwide. And what we want to understand is that 90 studies, some studies show that 92% of celiacs do not have villus healing. In other words, their villi don't heal. Why? Because they're following the traditional gluten-free diet, which is wrong. That's why I wrote No Grain, No Pain, it was to teach people about the true gluten-free diet. If you don't know what that is, go to your library and get a copy of No Grain, No Pain, or go, go to you know, Barnes & Noble and pick up a copy, or, or Amazon, you can get the Audible version, etc. But there's a huge difference between the two. And so where people don't heal, so to answer that question was, even after years of gluten-induced damage, can the villi return to normal? They can, provided you're not following that traditional diet. Because again, 92% of people following that traditional diet don't actually see recovery of the villi after that damage. So make sure you're following a no grain, no pain protocol. Okay. Let's see. Losing sleep from overactive bladder, already grain dairy processed food. Food. You have some type of bacterial abnormality or, or yeast overgrowth and that it's affecting your, um, your need to go to the bathroom repetitively. And so you might ask your doctor to rule out any type of urinary tract infection, kidney infection, um, and that, that may also hold some insights or some clues into why you're having kind of a frequency there that's disrupting your sleep. Because beyond that, if, you, if you're a female, it's not like a guy. A guy can get an enlarged prostate and that can, you know, that can cause uh, an increased frequency for them to wake up at night. But females, it's generally, it generally falls, in my experience anyway, under those, those first two categories that are mentioned. Okay, let's see here. Let me, I think we lost power on, so I can see the questions. Sorry, folks, we had a power outage. So bear with us as we um, pull the stream back up so I can read your questions and answer them. Here we go. Um, so let's see. What a, okay, I think I answered that question already. Yeah, so some of, it, some of you mentioned that getting sore throats from the paper surgical masks, especially if you've got a diagnosis of celiac disease, you should stay as far away from surgical masks as you can. Again, that Teflon coating has been known to create or increase the risk for the development of celiac disease. So, you know, the thought there, at least from the researcher's perspective, is the chemicals in the mask can actually potentiate damage to the GI tract uh, as a possible outcome. And that, that wouldn't surprise me if that's why you're experiencing that. Uh, is elderberry syrup especially good for zinc or is there more to the stuff? Elderberry is great. Uh, the problem with elderberry syrup, syrup is sugar, right? And sugar... As, a, as what we said earlier, causes ages, advanced glycation end products that suppress the immune system. So I don't like a lot of these syrups that are loaded down with sugar as a, you know, as a delivery vehicle system, right? It's basically they put elderberry in sugar to make it tasty. Um, you can eat elderberry naturally. I mean, I actually grow elderberry at home. Um, you can also take elderberry extracts in pills so that you don't have to necessarily take it in a syrup with all that sugar. But I like elderberry um, for immune support for sure. It's one of the one of the top of, on my list. I actually did a video a number of months ago talking about my favorite things. You can go back and search for that and watch it if you subscribe. 
um, you, you can check it out in our archives. Um, is liposomal vitamin D3 preferred if vitamin D3 supplementation does not work? Vitamin D supplementation works, um, Alexander. Uh, it works. It's not about liposomal versus non. It's about, oftentimes, about quantity. If you're taking vitamin D, for example, this is what I see a lot. A lot of people taking, you know, anywhere from four to 6,000 units, international units a day. This isn't going to do much. If you've got low D, this is going to maybe give you six or seven point increase in your levels. To get an elevation in your D, most people have to be solidly 10,000 units a day for a few months to get a good elevation. Now, the other thing though, it's not just about supplementing with D. And is liposomal D better? It's not liposomal. Think of it as, as vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So if you can take it in a mycelized form or a fat, a fat based form, you're gonna get better absorption than in a crystallized powder form. But if you're taking 10,000 a day, you'll overcome even if it's not liposomal. But where most people struggle with getting their vitamin D up and then keeping it up is that they have chronic inflammation. If you have chronic inflammation, your vitamin D level is, is there. Your vitamin D is being used basically to combat that inflammation. And so even if you're taking it, you're burning through it as you're taking it. Your body's using it up, right? So always have to address the chronic inflammation if you don't address that, so like me, I don't really take supplemental vitamin D except for twice a year. I take it in the fall and I take it again in kind of the middle of winter. I do a high dose vitamin D therapy just to make sure my levels are strong and high as a preventative. Um, but because I don't have a source of persistent chronic inflammation, I don't have any forms of autoimmune disease or other issues, my vitamin D lasts. And so it's better preserved. When you don't have chronic inflammation, the vitamin D that you make and produce is better preserved for you. And a lot of you that struggle with chronic inflammatory autoimmune problems, one of the, one of the issues you're struggling with is that, that chronic inflammation depletes your D faster. So even supplementing with higher levels is not enough to get it to pull it up where you need it to be. Um, So if you're doing a cortisol test, somebody's asking what kind of test to, to measure cortisol. I would recommend, it, it's not, you know, you can measure cortisol in the saliva. You can measure it in the blood. Probably the easiest way to measure it is saliva. Uh, and that's just because you can take saliva capture tubes home with you and you don't have to be in the doctor's office all day measuring it in the morning and then again at noon and then again in the afternoon, et cetera. So you can actually spit in vials and you can collect that and then the lab can analyze it. So that's probably the best way to do it, to get you, to get all of those points and to get a degree of accuracy of what's happening with your cortisol as time, uh, time goes on through the day. Let's see, go up, go up just a little there, right there. Um, okay. What, okay, go down just a little bit. What, uh, what protocol to support the immune system can you suggest to someone who is going to take a plane these days? Yeah, if you're gonna get on an airplane, um, one of the best things that you can do if you haven't done this already is vitamin D therapy. And you can, if you visit Gluten Free Society um, and just type in vitamin D therapy, um, you'll pull up a page that shows you how to do that. I'm not gonna belabor that in length here, but vitamin D therapy, and then five grams, vitamin C, okay, about five grams, okay, and this is per day, but you wanna do this, don't take all five grams at once. If you do that, it's gonna cause you gas, bloating, and potentially diarrhea. So split the dose, so two to three divided, doses. So again, if you're using like, if you're using my detox C powder, for example, you would take like a half a teaspoon three times a day, and that'll get you about five grams. If you're taking the tabsoles or the tablets, it's five, five of those is equal. Each one is worth one gram. So five is five grams. So you just take them, you know, you take one to two capsules every several hours to get to that five gram mark, but do that, you know, a couple of days before you get on that airplane, you know, during that trip, and then when you come back, 
maintain it for a, a good week after you get home. That way you, you get, you know, when you're breathing that two bear, you're just basically you're positioning yourself nutritionally support that immune system. But these are two of the biggest things right here. The C and the D would be, would be kind of a one, two punch in my opinion for what you should do if you're getting on an airplane and you want to keep it reasonable because you don't need to throw everything in the kitchen sink at an airplane ride. Your immune system and your health should be strong enough that you could survive an airplane ride without having to take elderberry and andrographis and extra zinc and everything else that we might suggest to, to boost immune uh, support. Uh, let's see, Wanda, can a happy lamp be a good sunshine alternative on a rainy day? No, it can be a great alternative for melatonin production, but a happy lamp won't make vitamin D. So it's not a complete substitute for sunshine. It's a partial substitute for sunshine, but it's better to do that than to get no sunshine and no uh, melatonin production. So it's, it's, it's not a complete alternative on a rainy day, but it, it will give you some benefit. So Cheryl is asking what the high dose vitamin D therapy is used for. It's used to, to charge your vitamin D levels. Vitamin D, well, here's what we know. I did a video on this. You can go to my, again, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you can check out that video. It's, it's vitamin D, the, the missing piece of the immune puzzle. And what I basically talk about in that video is that um, people that, that pick up viral infections, whether it be a COVID or whether it be anything else, and there was a new research study just published that people with COVID tended to have lower symptom side effects and they had lower mortality rates if their vitamin D levels were normal and it, they tended to have worse outcomes if their vitamin D levels were low. So high dose vitamin D therapy is just, it's a, it's a, it's a week long of taking high levels of vitamin D to get your levels up quickly, right? If, especially if you fear some type of immune uh, immune problem coming your way. A lot of people do this vitamin D therapy at the first sign of a cold or a flu. So if you start to kind of get a sore throat or the sniffles, like kind of the very first sign is you knock out a round of vitamin D therapy. And a lot of times that'll be enough to help your body through something without, you know, without knocking you back or knocking you down. Okay. What exercises do I recommend for those with previous back injuries who can't do sit-ups. So if you've got a back injury, I would say, why can't you do sit-ups? Regardless of a previous back injury, if you can't do sit-ups, it's because you haven't rehabbed properly from your back injury. So the first thing I would tell you to do is go follow up with somebody knowledgeable about back rehab and get to a point where you have enough core strength because a sit-up is a fundamental basic body movement and surgery should not restrict you from being able to sit up. Uh, I'm talking about a classic basic sit-up. So you've got a deeper problem if you're if you're unable to do that. Uh, let's see here. Marcia says, I love your liquid vitamin D3. I had my levels checked recently and they were good. Thank you. You're welcome, Marcia. Thanks for supporting us at Gluten Free Society. Um, let's see here. All righty. Okay, looks like yeah, we lost the feed, so it looks like we lost some of the some of the questions in that. Um, I think I answered that one. Scroll up on the right for me, and maybe we could refresh the feed. Uh, yeah, I have to pop over on the window and do it. Give me one second. Okay, let's see here. Sorry, folks, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty tonight. Um, so trying to get you guys back up and running here. Okay, okay, go back down a little bit. Yeah, I think I got to those. Um, yeah, Renee's asking, is the video available once you're done? Yeah, Renee, and if you subscribe, you actually get an email with a link to the videos and the archives. So make sure that, um, that you subscribe to the channel and we'll um, not only get you access to the replay, but get you reminders on where to find it. 
So let's see here. After taking high dose vitamin D, Ultra D3 for three days, should I continue taking one capsule daily? So if you're doing if you're doing the vitamin D therapy that I recommend, that you take three capsules a day for three days, and then you take one capsule a day for three days, and after that you can discontinue. Now there's a caveat to that. If you're doing vitamin D therapy, please, please, please pay attention to this. Do not do vitamin D therapy if uh, if you have kidney disease, if you have um, sarcoidosis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects your kidneys. Um, because if you, if you have a kidney issue, you can actually cause calcium, uh, rises in the blood that can be critical. That can actually put you in danger's way or harm's way. So you have to make sure that when you're doing vitamin D therapy, you don't have preexisting kidney disease or sarcoidosis. Very important to remember that. Now, if you're clear of those two things, if you've gone through a round of therapy, the next best step would just be to ask your doctor to, to measure your 25... OH D levels. And your goal coming into fall, you want that to be between 70 and 100. Now the range for most labs, most labs will have a range of 20 to 100 or 30 to 100, meaning they're going to call you normal if you're 20 and 30. And this is actually most of the reading, leading researchers on vitamin D know that that should not be part of the normal lab range. And that if you're really trying to be optimal for immune function, you want it to be between 70 and 100, not as low as 20, 30, 40s, 50s, not the best level. Let's get it up into that range, especially if you're coming into these you know, fall, winter months and, and your goal is to give your immune system strength. Now, well, let's see here. So where can someone start if they are so reactive to every supplement that they take and so then they can't take them? I would start, if, 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 if I were looking, I would start at looking at mold toxicity because it's very potentially possible you have a mold issue you don't even know about. Supplement overreactivity or reacting to supplements, oftentimes if you react to every supplement, that's a, a hallmark of, of being exposed or being in mold. So I would have mold investigated as a potential possibility. Okay, let's see here. All right, I think I answered that one. Somebody's asking if I support recommendations of Dr. Gundry. Look, I know Dr. Gundry, he's a friend of mine. He's a great guy, he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of good information as well. But you have to be more specific, Karen. It's, it's, I don't ever support anybody's broad spectrum recommendation or generalizations about anything. And, and so you have to be specific, more specific about the question that you're asking. Uh, let's see. Okay, so somebody's asking, how could a mailman be low in vitamin D despite being outside? Chronic inflammation, again, sunshine doesn't guarantee that you're going to make enough vitamin D to get it through. The other thing you have to understand is vitamin D, you know, one of the advice that's given out by skin docs, dermatologists, is sunscreen, right? SPF, sun protection factor. Well, if sun protection factor higher than eight, so if it's higher than eight, it will block vitamin D synthesis. It will block it from forming in your skin. So if you lather up with SPF eight or more, and most of most women do, and some, some guys do, the lotion that they're using on their face and hands and arms actually can have SPF in it. And if it's greater than eight, it will inhibit vitamin D synthesis by the skin. So that might also be playing a role in it. Let's see here. Okay, so somebody's asking about, do I believe that, that everybody should be lectin-free? And the answer is no, it's impossible to be lectin-free. Lectin's a family of proteins, not just found in plants. It's also found in a number of different meats and other foods. So I don't, I think that some people need to be um, aware of lectins and reduce their lectin um, exposure. But does everybody need to go on a lectin-free diet? No, absolutely not. I don't support that as a broad spectrum generalization. But again, there is a benefit for many going lectin free. Uh, let's see here. All right. So looks like we're hitting the wall here. 
if I missed your question, it's because we had a tech failure tonight. We had the power in the building go out. And we're lucky that we were able to just maintain the stream. So um, that's a wrap, folks, for, for Monday night show this week. Hopefully you found those tips practical and healthy. Now I would just say go out and, and you know employ them as quickly as possible as we enter October and even more importantly, as we enter November you know, the play is going to get worse. We don't, we can't predict the future and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen uh, in the world. But, uh, you know, I will suspect that, that many of you after the, the months of stress of being locked down, being masked up, um, being socially isolated, some of you have lost jobs and sources of income and that all those things that have happened as a result over the fear of what's going on in the world have completely turned your immune system upside down. And if you begin by, by doing what we talked about today, by processing the things that we discussed tonight, you know, you'll take yourself so much further. When the tech issues happen, they just happen. Um, you'll take, yeah, that even, that even zeroed out on me. So you'll take yourself so much further then, then if you don't do them, so remember those key fundamentals, right? It's sunshine, it's exercise, it's sleep, it's clean food, it's avoidance of chemicals, it's getting fresh air and, and being outside. Like those are fundamental to human health and to human life. And relationships and community are also fundamental. So, you know, the social isolationism that many of you have experienced have depleted your immune systems and you maybe weren't even aware of it. So, you know, make a conscientious effort to be around the people that you love and the people that love you back and apply these tips tonight and it'll take your immune system a long way. And, and as an end note, again, if you're not already subscribed, come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. I have the world's largest gluten-free newsletter on the true gluten-free diet. And if you sign up, we'll send you a bunch of free tools that you can start implementing on diet navigation and how to really begin this process of healthy gluten-free eating. We'll see you back again next week, 6 p.m. same time for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a fantastic week, take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.